views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mission BX. Mission BX is a collaboration between BronxNet and the Center for Bronx Nonprofits at Hostos Community College. We take you into the wonderful world of Bronx nonprofits. And this week, we have a very special guest with us. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Hi, everyone. Welcome again. It's Eileen Newman, the host of Mission BX. And this time we're visiting with Elena Rodriguez from the Mary Mitchell Family Center. This center has been a, a bonus to the community for many, many years. And Elena is a wonderful executive director. And we're going to ask her about the history of the organization, what they're doing now, and find out what their plans are for the future. So. Elena, thank you so, so much for doing this. I know you have a lot going on, but thanks for being with us. So, so I, I'm sure because the organization has been around for a while that many people know about Mary Mitchell, but, but can you tell us the history? Because it's, there's, there's been a, a, a lot of changes and growth. And so can you tell us a little bit about the history of the organization? Yeah, definitely. So the Mary Mitchell Center was built in 1997, um, and it was originally, found, originally founded by Austin Hokobo and the Cortona Community Coalition at that time. Um, Mary Mitchell herself was a strong community advocate um, for the East Tremont Cortona community, and she would engage youth. Um, specifically around helping them to get employment within the area and doing a lot of um, recreational act activities, specifically in the summer, doing things on the, on the street to keep them active and so forth. And she was able to use the space before it became the Mary Mitchell Center that it is today um, and engage youth in the community. And then um, as history went on, the Bronx was during the time when the Bronx was burning, the Mary, that center that she was using was burnt down. Um, and the community came in and engaged with Austin Okobo um, and um, the, Cortona, the Cortona Community Coalition also was there and advocated and did awareness in the Bronx to make the Mary Mitchell Center. So they were able to get funding from elected officials to build the facility and it was officially built in 1997. And how far away from where you are now was the original building? So from my understanding, um, again, this was before my time, but it was actually here. So it was on the same grounds that the Mary Mitchell Center was on. Oh. Um, and when it burnt down, they were able to rebuild upon it on this space. So you know what, what I find interesting at, at Hostos, we just had an event around um, the life of a woman who had also been a real activist in the Bronx, um, getting involved with all sorts of wonderful um, movements and helping people. So there seems to be, I mean, I'm sure a lot of men have done a lot too, as we know, but there seems to be this, Mary Mitchell seems to be somewhat typical of a lot of the women who helped to rebuild the Bronx. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, she's well known. I know her grandson is still in the community and also comes by to the center now and then. Um, but she's someone who is a, still a very familiar face and a familiar name. And a lot of the community members still live here. Um, and they remember her and remember everything that she did for their youth and their kids. And Mary Mitchell Center is trying to continue that in her legacy and in her name. That's wonderful. So Elena, how did you get involved and how did you become the ED? And and I know that that um, that you had, as you have told me when we've spoken before, that that down the road you were seeing yourself at, as the ED, but a very sad event is why you're 
it happened more quickly than you might have thought. But yeah. but um, but tell us about you and what you were doing and how this all happened. Yeah, definitely. So I started volunteering with the Marie Mitchell Center over about eight years ago now. So it was when I was a um, sophomore in college. And I just started off volunteering and I looked in, I went to the University of Vermont and I was doing a research paper and I found an article on the La Canasta program. And at that time, Heidi Hines, the executive director was running La Canasta and she had her email at the bottom. And I said, you know what, this looks like a great program that's happening in the Bronx. And I wanted, even though I was studying in Vermont, I focused all my studies on the Bronx because I knew and I wanted to come so back. I'm gonna home. interrupt you and ask you what La Canasta was, is. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so La Canasta um, is essentially a food buying club. So the way that Heidi was running it was that she was picking up fresh produce, um, fruits and vegetables and grains from the Hunts Point Market and distributing it to families across the Bronx. So she was going to schools, to hospitals, um, such as St. Barnabas, um, and, and um, also delivering to community members and residents in the Bronx. She was delivering these the fresh bags of produce um, across the Bronx um, for a very affordable price, which ranged from $25 to $20. And she also accepted EBT to include everyone into this program. Um, now we're actually, due to what happened with Heidi, and I'm going to explain that in a little bit, and um, COVID, the program had to go on a standstill, and we're actually bringing it back in honor of Heidi as um, Heidi's Healthy Canasta. And we're trying to have the same initiative where we're providing fresh fruits and vegetables and greens to residents in the Bronx at a much more affordable rate due to what's happened um, due to COVID and the economic crisis. Um, but that's something that's gonna be coming back to the community to help increase food access, which is essentially what Heidi was trying to do. Because as we know, there's places that we could go and get food. There's a lot of fast food restaurants. There's a lot of unhealthy places for us to get food and the supermarkets are readily available, but they're also, you know, sometimes the prices there are high for fresh fruits and vegetables. And sometimes the fresh fruits and vegetables aren't as fresh as they should be. Um, so the idea of getting it from the Hunts Point Market when it's fresh on the same day and delivering it to families helps them to um, relieve the amount of time that they have to go shopping to buy these produce and everything. And they are able to have more time to spend with their families and prepare a healthy meal instead of having to go to the alternative of trying to just get something quick to provide to their families. So I'm interested in how, when you were going to school in the Bronx, I mean, in, in Vermont, you were you did you grow up in the Bronx? What was your connection? Yeah, so I was born and raised in the Bronx. I okay. went to all elementary, middle school, high school, all in the Bronx. Um, and when I was in high school, um, it actually started off with my sister. My sister left to go to college and she went to Vermont. And okay. when I visited her, I was like, oh my God, like I need to get out too. Like I, I wanted to see other things. And when I went to the University of Vermont, maybe like three weeks in, I got extreme culture shock because um, there's not a lot of people that look like me. And wow. I missed home a lot. And I did not think that was going to happen until I left. And I realized at that moment that I was going to use everything that I can to stay there and and um, focus on my studies. But I knew I was going to come back home. I knew everything that I wanted to do was here. So I just that one paper that I did in my sophomore class was how I met Heidi. And I did my senior thesis with Heidi and Karen Washington. Um, and that's how I ended up getting into the Mary Mitchell Center, starting off volunteering, eventually being employed as a sustainability director. And unfortunately, due to Heidi's passing in 2019 due to cancer, um, we were looking for the executive director role. And at that time, we did have Wanda Solomon step in as the interim director. And Heidi was training me to be the executive director of the Austin Hakobo Center, which was supposed to be. Um, but that, I could get into that too. But unfortunately, that didn't happen as well. And it has a lot of implications, COVID part of it. Um, and I applied to be the ED here at the Marine Mitchell Center. and. That's how I got here. And I'm trying my best to being a single mom of two young girls 
Very um, young. Yes. <laughs> Take the color audience are young. <laughs> Yes, oh my gosh, I have a two and a half year old now and a 16 month. So they're very close to me. <laughs> they keep me busy, very, very busy, but I love them so much. Um, but they are the reason too why I continue to do this work because I know I want to be here and I want to do everything I can for the families in the area. And I want my babies to also you know, be healthy and have everything that everybody else should have. So like, I want to try to be not a mom to everybody because I know I can't do that. Be, oh, yeah. put, put my motherly skills out there to try to help out the best that I can. Which you are doing a wonderful job and, and during during not, a, not an easy time. So tell me a little bit and then we're, I'm going to probably have to stop you in the middle because we're going to have to take a break. Yeah. But but let's start talking about before COVID what your your base programs were. So there's the food program. Mm -hmm. Yes. So our base programs before COVID, we had a very enriching after school program um, and a summer camp program. And we were able to have up to 77 kids and they will come from the local um, schools in the area um, for the after school program, we will pick them up and they will come here. Um, we were able to get between the ages of five and 12 years old. Um, the program ran from 2.30 to 6. And then in the summer, it was a pretty much all day program and they can come from anywhere in the community and be enrolled in the summer camp program. And we will take them out on trips. We would do extra um, curricular activities within the center and so forth. Um, we also have branching from that program is our teen program. So um, once the kids phase out at after 12, when they turn 13, they phase out of our programs and we would have a teen program where they would become mentors. Um, and a part of that is the Food Justice Club, which was something that we were luckily able to keep running during COVID. Um, but before they would come into the Mary Mitchell Center, they would do a lot of discussions around food, um, food insecurity, food advocacy, um, social justice, and they would have all these conversations of what they see happening in their community and how they wanted to make a difference. And then they would, create lessons um, to teach to the younger group of the center. So those 13, 14 mm -hmm. years old, year old kids, and then they would mentor the even younger kids um, that were enrolled in the after school or summer camp program. So basically it would have this effect of they're learning from their oldest and to the next generation um, in hopes to like instill this, this likelihood of creating change in the community as they get older. So I'm going to stop you there for a minute because we just have to take a short break and then we'll come back and, and hear and hear more about that and also about what happened when COVID hit and what you, you're seeing for the future. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the state health department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. It's gonna go way further than we actually can understand. Dan. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We're having a chat with Elena Rodriguez, who is the wonderful co-executive director of the Mary Mitchell Center. And we've just been talking about some of their programs, including a teen program where older teens are working with younger children, which is wonderful. So Elena, can you tell, continue talking about that? Yes, definitely. So like I was saying, the younger teens get a the younger teens get a wonderful opportunity with being mentors with the youth 
that are ages between five and 12 at the community center. And these include various activities that they come up with with the Food Justice Club. Um, some things can range around doing like workshops and doing um, uh, activities where they're just shouting out things on how to eat healthy or making signage so they can learn what it is to eat healthy. Um, other things include going to the community garden. So the Mary Mitchell Center is great at um, partnering with our local community gardens and La Familia Verde, which is a coalition of five community gardens in the area. And we are able to bring our youth out um, every, hopefully every summer um, to go into the gardens and actually plant and grow and um, sustain these plants that they're growing. And with the Food Justice Club, they are able to do that. Um, so the Food Justice Club will go in, they'll plant, they'll help to maintain the garden beds, and they'll bring in the younger youth to do activities that can range from tastings to um, garden hunts, um, and even just having conversation in this space um, to, to basically take themselves out of that city and urban life and step into a natural um, space that is within an urban area, which sometimes is hard to find. Um, so those are some of the things that they do, and they also help at the farmer's market. So oh, we are very lucky to nice. partner with um, La Familia Verde's farmer's market that runs in the summer from July to November, and the teens are able to run a farm stand during that time as well, where they're able to see the entrepreneurship side and gain skills on um, marketing and engaging the community to buy from the farmer's market, why it's important to support our local farmers, um, but they also get to manage their own stand. So they, they manage the sales and things like that, um, how they can sell, sell more produce, what were they able to bring in, and how can they engage the community. So they're able to work with the youth, but also get some experience for themselves so they could put something really nice on their resume to help them get employment after they are finished with our program. That's terrific. I wish we could be outside and see this and that it was oh, later. Yeah. So maybe yeah. we'll do a, a little circle around community gardens when we can when we can be um, shooting outside. But so obviously that's not happening right now. What happened when COVID hit? Did you have to shut everything out? Everything yeah. down? Yes, yes. Um, Unfortunately, pretty much the only thing that we were able to successfully run that was from our previous programs was the Food Justice Club, um, the Teen Justice Club. And that was because we were able to do that via Zoom and the students that were enrolled, they all had laptops because they had to um, do their studies in their school remotely. Um, so that was something that we were easy able to easily transition to, but we did have to stop our summer camp program, stop the after school program. And it was a very stressful time because when the city announced that it was closing, the Mary Mitchell Center is um, owned by the DOE. So we follow the DOE schedule. So when the DOE shut down, we were shut down the entire time until we were able to get access to the center again. And slowly restart our program. So even when we got back in a little bit earlier than when schools resumed, but we were still not able to have community members in, we weren't able to have our programs running. And it was very hard to let the community know that our doors were here, but our doors are still not able to open yet because right. of the guidelines through the DOE. Um, but what we were able to do during COVID and this is definitely because of my co-executive director, Lurgen Guzman, from, I mean, like the very next day that we shut down, she was able to get food from Assemblyman Michael Blake, um, Salamanca, um, Richie Torres. We were able to get food from all our elected officials and she began distributing the food out along with volunteers that she was able to recruit from the community. And I mean, driving to families' homes and dropping off the food because at that time it was just so scary that we did not want to have people lining up and people weren't really coming outside and the supermarket lines were ridiculous. So she was bringing prepared meals, um, anything that we were able to get um, from elected officials and bringing it to their homes, especially the seniors. Um, and she was driving around for a while until we were able to get a grant and we were able to start to go to um, like Jetro, like wholesale places and purchase produce that was um, 
appropriate to the community. So we made sure that everything that we purchased was stuff that people would want and name brands that they recognized. Um, and we did non-perishable items. And that was something that we were able to do um, after a while. We were able to even get masks and things like that. So we were able to provide this when we were doing distribution events and people would line up along the community garden. We did it in front of um, Garden of Youth on East Tremont and 180th. I mean, um, yes, um, Prospect and 180th, I'm sorry. And then we were able to do it in front of Mary Mitchell Center, even though we weren't, at that time, we still didn't have access. And we were actually working out of the mom's office, the Mothers on the Move office on Intervale Avenue. And that's where Lurgen was going with the volunteers, bagging all of the produce to then come back over here, leaving some there to distribute to that community. Um, and then coming back here to distribute to the area here. And once our, our Mary, the Mary Mitchell Center opened, we were able to get donations um, from Montefiore and Coach. And um, again, the photos that you saw, they were shoes, beautiful jackets and clothing that the community absolutely appreciated and loved. So we were able to give them that alongside with a bag of food. So they would come in and get a bag of food, bring them in um, either by their family or one by one. We were making sure that everyone was social distancing and they got to choose one clothing attire and one pair of shoes for themselves and any PPE equipment that we had. So if we had masks or hand sanitizers, we were always giving that out at every distribution depending on what we were getting in from donations so everything that we received went right back to the community almost immediately because we know that the need is there and it's still there yes that's that's a big point and i just wanted to mention that that lurgen was going to join us today but but she got stuck literally stuck somewhere and is not able to be with us so so but i'm i'm so glad that you spoke about the wonderful work that she's been doing so so i have another couple of questions before we um leave you and and the the biggest one i guess is what are your big so you're a new ED, you take over under difficult situation of having a beloved ED, unfortunately passed, much too young, and you take over in the middle of a pandemic. So at this point, when things seem to be getting a little bit better, what's, what are your biggest challenges? That both is personally, you can say both because a lot of times we want to know how people are. It's not just the work. Yes, but. yes. That that honestly, that's the hardest question. Um, I'll start off with personally, and then I'll I'll, I'll jump into um, Mary Mitchell Center. Um, but personally, myself, um, I lost my dad to COVID. Um, he contracted it um, and was in the hospital on March 30th, and. He passed away June 8th um, last year. And that was a very hard time for me coming in. When I became the ED, it, I came. I started in February. I also just had, had just come off maternity leave. Um, and when I came into the Mary Mitchell Center, two weeks later, COVID hit. Um, another two weeks later, my dad was in the hospital. And I was working from home, just trying to do everything that I can. Um, and I had to take some time off when my dad passed away because I'm very, very close to my dad. And um, he was the one that really encouraged me to, to step into this position at the Mary Mitchell Center. Um, so it was very hard for me to see myself in this position without him by my side. Um, sorry, I get emotional. But um, that's okay. I know like both him and Heidi was my mentor. So it, I lost, I lost my two pillars um, and they gave me all the strength that I have to, you know, to do everything that I'm doing. And now my daughters do that for me. So every time I look at my daughters, I, 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 you know, I see my dad. I remember Heidi holding my youngest while I was in a meeting, trying to put her to sleep. And it, they helped me to keep going. Um, but it was a hard time for me. Um, as it was for everybody, losing people and and um, coping with loss. And I feel like talking about the future, I think I'm becoming more sentimental now as things are getting better and more hopeful because I'm having this feeling of wanting things to go back to normal, but realizing 
that it's not going to be normal because you want to do these normal things, but your people aren't there anymore. So it's like, how, how am I going to mentally bring myself to keep pushing forward and realizing that I want Heidi here, I want my dad here, but that, that part's just not gonna happen. So how can I create a new normal life, life for my daughters and I? Um, so that's me personally, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. You know, I have to say, Elena, that this is the story that we don't hear. You know, people talk about the work, they, they talk about, and, and which is wonderful, and, and what they're doing, but, but what you, because we're going to have to, I'm sorry, but we're running out of time, but, but what you've done is so bring it home, because it isn't just about the, the work of nonprofits and the, and the wonderful stuff you're doing and getting people food and, that, and having, if everybody picks a piece of clothes, I mean, all of those things. And, but it's, it's what you're dealing with at the same time by giving so much to other people. And I think it's, from my perspective, it's so symbolic of what so, so many people are doing here in the Bronx. Yes. That, that's, why, that's why we have this show, <laughs> to really look at, at people like you and who are, it's, it's not like, oh, I have this job and then I, I go home and everything's fine or the job is easy and, you know, or I, I work really hard, but at five o'clock it's done and I'm okay. It's not, no. it's not. And especially in the Bronx, people are just trying to balance giving their all to the people of the Bronx and also trying to figure out their family and, and themselves. Yes, yes. And I, I feel like that's why when you're in this nonprofit work and doing what we're all doing, you have to love what you do. If you view it as a paycheck and you're just coming in to get paid and check out, it's it's not the same. But if you love what you do, and I view Mary Mitchell Center as my family, the board, the kids, the community, they're all part of my family. They're my extended family. So I take home what they're going through and vice versa. So it, it does help us to move forward. And when we try to come up with the future plans and everything, we include all these people so we can make better decisions and continue to do the best that we can for the East Tremont Cotona community, which is where the Mary Mitchell Center is primarily located in. Lena, thank you so so much, and thank you for being, thank you for everything you do, and thank you for being so honest. So that 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 you by by having this conversation can really, I'm sure that many people will feel very close to you when they see this, and and be grateful that you told your story, and 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 we know the story of so many people. Yes, yes, and if anyone ever wants to reach out. And like if they're going through anything similar or they just need an open ear, I I love listening to people's stories. And sometimes having someone that you can talk to, you can always contact me here at the Rain Mitchell Center. My contact information is on our website, um, whether it's to talk about connecting with the center or on other personal matters of what you went through doing COVID or a family loss. I would love to help any way that I can. And maybe we can sort of facilitate getting people together around that. So so we'll talk about that but again thank you thank you thank you and sending a big hug thank you thank you Thanks. thank you all for being with us for that that very wonderful conversation with elena rodriguez from the mary mitchell center if you've missed a part of this or if you want to see it again or if you want to share this with friends go to bronxnet.tv look for mission bx and you'll find us there and you'll find other shows there that we've done. So looking forward to seeing you all again. Um, and I hope you all stay well, as well as your families. Thank you.